Alteration 4, Yoshihiro Tagashi and Choice. Alright, we're just straight jumping into the content on this one. I'm sure it will all make sense later when we combine all these parts into one long video. It doesn't help that this part 2 is one of the more scattered ones to put together. After the content loss from the removed Spirit Detective arc, the differences in the anime and the manga become a bit neglectable, until the Dark Tournament, making placing points together here a bit difficult. However, simply shifting around scenes is not the only thing I'm limited to in enhancing our enjoyment of Togashi's works. As we understand now about our protagonist Yusuke, the story is one of him making choices about who he wants to become, but I think it's interesting to view this concept of choice in a more overarching view of his works. Choice is something that all of Togashi's main protagonists must deal with. From Yusuke to Prince Baka to Gan, the amount of options that these characters do or do not have becomes a powerful point of development in all of their arcs. And we'll use the collective knowledge of these three characters to see just how much Togashi has a tendency to come back to this idea. With the quality of Hunter x Hunter analysis that has come out in recent years, it should be no surprise that Gan may be the character most overtly centered around this idea. Sapile almost says as much during the York New arc. He extrapolates on Gan's inherent and boundless curiosity, realizing that if Gan wanted to, his mindset could lead him to becoming a master in anything he so wished. The very thought of which scared him to his core. If he became an inventor, he'd revolutionize whatever field he walked into. If he became a conservationist, his reputation alone might scare off poachers. If Gan became a thief, he would be able to steal everything from the stars to your life. Even looking back on the Hunter exam as an arc, a huge portion of it is dedicated to exploring and presenting choices. The two-choice quiz was designed to prepare contestants for very real moral conundrums out in the field. The second stage cooking challenge was about learning to appreciate the value and choosing the specialization you decide on. Trick towers perhaps obviously stage around playing with the idea of majority decision always being right, but Gan's interaction with Hanzo the ninja particularly stands out. Despite being coerced by force, Gan did not particularly get upset about the methods Hanzo used. He wanted to change the paradigm to be a fair choice for both parties, saying despite the fact that if Hanzo seriously injured or killed him, if he lost the hope of being able to see his goal through to the end, then that's really no choice at all. Prince Baka is one of Togashi's lesser known characters, but perhaps one of the most distinct. In effect, he represents what would happen if all of humankind's collective was embodied in one sadistic idiot. Over the course of level E, we learn two things about him. That Prince Baka enjoys using his abilities for his own amusement, and that he refuses to be constrained. Then he gets married. A perfectly hilarious end for a comedy to be sure. But while Prince Baka was tricked into marrying his princess, he did ultimately stick around in the end. The story Full Moon in Level E ends with the reveal that the princess led Baka on throughout an exciting ride that only made him think that his choices throughout the chase mattered. We can surmise from his ending line You're fascinating. that Prince Baka came to the conclusion that his adventures will be more with his princess than without. In both cases of Baka and Gan, the most impactful moments in the story come about when they make a choice, or their actions hinge around potential choices. More so for Gan when he considered that extra level of tragedy of him throwing away all his future for revenge against Pito, and the understanding that his Nen being reset and being stuck at home doing homework is a true new beginning. Incidentally, being stuck at home doing homework is another thing we will be revisiting before the series is done. So why do I mention the importance of choice in Togashi's work? In part to show how much the theme is central to his mindset, and in part to contextualize a small moment in Yusuke's behavior that people have been fixated on that I'm getting tired of seeing bantered around without context. That being a time where Yusuke, and to some the author by extension, is supposedly acting in a transphobic manner, just before his first encounter with Togoro. Yeah, I'm not thrilled about having to use word space for this either. Yusuke, after defeating Miyuki of the Ogre Triad Vertex, points out that she was a cross-dresser, and after, she claims that Yusuke only fought her for being different. Yusuke calls foul and says that she should make up her mind before getting into any more fights. Now, let's set aside the obvious hypocrisy that Miyuki is making in this scene by saying that Yusuke only attacked her for being different, and he would act differently if she was a woman, when Miyuki is clearly a demon under the employment of an evil business tyrant, and clearly ready to kill both of them for no particular reason. Let's break this scene down a bit. Firstly, this scene doesn't look good in isolation, of course. As a matter of fact, this scene isn't one of Yusuke's best moments at all. It's not supposed to be. And the answer to why lies in Yusuke's development arc, an interest of Yu Hakusho as a story. Yu Hakusho is a story about Yusuke discovering what choices he wants to make about his life, so that he can live his best life. The reason is that this scene of him calling out Miyuki is more projection than anything. 
Because for someone who can't make up their own mind about life, it's easier for them to call other people on it than reconcile with that issue themselves. So in this context, is Yusuke calling out a cross-dressing person on their inadequacies because of his own unresolved issues? Well, if you listen to that sentence I just said, with your common sense, that answer is obviously no. Yusuke at this point is a school-aged, brash, rude, unapologetic bundle of nerves and aggression. He is not the morality center of the narrative. In fact, one of those does not exist in any of Togashi's works. Obviously, he is not going to always act in ways that are favorable. What this scene is most certainly not is transphobic. First of all, just before this scene takes place, Yusuke verbatim says, I don't care, man or woman, young or old, you want to fight, I'll give you one. Establishing off the bat this is not a gender issue. But to even think Yoshihiro Togashi of all authors is transphobic for making this scene is ridiculous. It's a well-known fact that Togashi's interests include gender studies. Not only that this manifests and works several times over, Togashi regularly creates transgender characters or ones that transition. Alaka in her story is recognized as one of the best stories about transgender and otherness acceptance. In one of the Yu Hakusho's volume extras, Togashi talked about his desire to create a transgender protagonist for a sports manga. And most obscurely, one level E story revolves entirely around a girl's female to male transition as she looks for love at a resort. Given the amount of honest interests and storylines that Togashi has created about the topics of gender, it's discourteous to make such claims. Alteration 5. Truncation of the Dark Tournament To a certain degree, everything from the daily life arc to just before the Dark Tournament is adapted faithfully. Of course, this being the anime, there are plenty of minor alterations here and there, but for the most part, all of the changes are general extensions of fight scenes. I don't consider things that don't help or hinder the adaptation to be worth discussing. An occasional fight scene or extra banner in a scene here and there is doing what the adaptation does best, adding characters to content that is already there. As such, I don't want to spend much time commenting on things you could pick up yourselves. However, I do think that when talking about Togashi's work, too much is more damaging than too little. Togashi as a writer is always sure to cover his bases. If you were to just adapt what was there into an anime, you would have a short, punchy, and functional piece. Adding too much, however, means to a degree diluting his natural ideas and tendencies, and can ultimately counteract those themes. The Dark Tournament is long, in my opinion much too long and it suffers on rewatch. This breaks down into separate issues, the first being the quality of the fights, and the second being the addition of certain character arcs that, well, they don't work. Let's talk about the first. Most of the additions to the Dark Tournament are, as to be expected, cosmetic, extension on fight scenes, periods of build-up followed by some of the most legendary animation clips of Carnage you can ask for in a fighting anime. While I'm not opposed to this fundamentally, I need to stress that Yu Hakusho fights aren't the greatest in anime history from a technical standpoint. When Togashi wrote Yu Hakusho, he hadn't developed the concept of Nen, although he showed numerous signs of establishing the basis for it, and they were mostly run on pure emotions or tactics we aren't privy to on the possibility of happening. Surprisingly, many of the moments of the fight maintain the desired effects these twists were supposed to have, but the longer you as a reader are made to spend time on the fights, the more noticeable the lack of solid ground they have. Keeping the fight short and relatively punchy when not backed up by a strong emotional core is what made them good in the manga. When it comes to the anime, the dark tournament fights get painfully dragged out. Of course, this is just my opinion, but I think a general calling of some of these scenes to be closer to the whole would do wonders. I won't be giving an analysis of each individual fight scene to tell what needed to be cut as extra. That would be a job for a professional, and more importantly, it's too time consuming. Alteration 6. Removal. There's no freedom for the sinner named Sakio. I'm not letting this abomination slide, just because it panders to people's hearts. So remember how I was just talking about too much being more damaging than too little one section ago? That comes to a head right here in the most disgusting fashion. Sakio is established to be complete human trash devoid of any redeeming qualities. A rich sociopath who treats life's resources and consequences, all his things to just entertain him. He's the mastermind behind much of the shady going-ons in the Dark Tournament, and his ambition to open up a portal to the demon world is one of the inciting incidents that leads directly into the Chapter Black arc. In many ways, Sakio was the perfect villain for the Dark Tournament, even more so for Toguro. Because where Toguro's heart was stained by tragedy, and he never truly sold his standards for his ambitions, Sakio was the opposite, always inundated from the consequences of his relatively cushy life. His obsession with death turned him into a monster, through no one's fault but his own. Sakio was the worst type of person. He was the perfect embodiment of evil that Sensui saw in humanity. A man with no ideals, and no ambition to help anyone but his own entertainment. 
Sometimes I'd play a little game where I'd challenge myself to see how long I could keep something alive once I had carved out its heart. But in time, we all grow more mature and realize that there's more to life than blood, guts, and minimum wage. I soon discovered that with gambling, I could translate all my teenage obsessions into cold, hard cash, and there was no turning back. So it's a damn shame that the anime attempts a slapdash effort to make a more human and down-to-earth character, when he himself established in no uncertain terms that he is anything of the sort. The Yu Yu Hakusho anime attempts to flaccidly humanize Sakio with two mechanisms, by vaguely alluding to the idea that Sakio has some sort of grander altruistic vision of a united demon and human world, and by giving him a romantic subplot. <coughs> Gag me. First things first, why? The line in question for Sakio goes as such. How do I know the plan ends with you? Yes, you've been keeping your informants busy. And somewhere along the line, you learned of my humble aspiration to dissolve the barrier between worlds, let demons of every size cross to the human side, annul the careful order your kind has enforced. I find life would be better that way, and I know one day it will be so. And I can only wonder at this point what they are thinking in adding this line. While the justification of Spirit World's order is a discussion that the manga would eventually have, there is no way Sakia would be privy to the issues behind the curtain that even Koei Aonma doesn't know about. It is as I said, an illusion, only there to raise a last minute question. And considering that the anime would not truly follow up on this plot thread, it is also an unresolved promise. For whatever reason, the anime has an aversion to the cold and evil depiction of Sakio Togashi intended. And that's one thing, in and above itself. But for what purpose did they have to bring Shizuru into this? To start with, the Dark Tournament adds numerous scenes of interactions between the girls of Yu Hakusho. Specifically, the dynamic of Keiko, Shizuru, Yukina, and Botan. None of these happen in the manga. While it is established that the girls are present in the tournament audience, the vast majority of their antics and commentary aren't present. From this, we can determine that they just wanted the girl to have more presence in the arc itself, which is fine itself, but their attempts to use Shizuru as a tool to humanize Sakio are just as they sound. Now, I enjoy the extended scenes of the girls. Personality is what this adaptation excels at, after all. But what good is it to both build up Shizuru as a solid woman that keeps the punk Kuwabara in line, while at the same time making up some half-interesting excuses for her to project past relationships onto Sakio. I'm left with so many questions. Least of all is why Shizuru is acting like a damsel in distress towards a man she meets no more than four times. Was this to emphasize the tragedy of Sakio choosing to kill himself with his ambitions? Well again, and I cannot stress this enough, and today more than ever, rich evil bastards like Sakio do not deserve empathy. They don't need to be given any sort of sympathy when the life of evil they choose is entirely their own, and Sakio admits as much himself. Not only was this an unneeded addition to the watch time, that everyone would be better without, but it singles a sharp divergence from the inherent misanthropic core at the heart of many of Togashi's ideas. What I can only suspect compelling the appalling changes was that they wanted to further push the more romantic angles of Yu Hakusho by having one of the other female leaves find some sort of love. What I don't understand is if they wanted to have a scorned woman archetype going through the arc of overcoming alienation to find connection, why use Shizuru of all people? when Yusuke's mother is perfectly available for this task. And that's another thing I didn't touch on about this entire arc, but Yusuke's mom is just in the stands in the manga, along with Shizuru and the rest. She gets no less page time than Shizuru, more in fact. And at the end of the manga, we get to see her chatting it up with Yusuke's piece of garbage father. By the way, Yusuke has a dad. Cut all the Saki and Shizuru business out and don't turn back. Alteration 7. Keep. Yusuke saves Pooh. There are some scenes that I find it hard to reasonably do without in Yu Hakusho. So much so that I think they're easily viewable on their own, without the need to watch the entire series back again for them. But less so because they signify emotional or spectacle impact, and more because they're natural extensions of the character arcs. Did I really need several minute long scenes of Hiei amping himself up for the Dragon of Darkness Flame? Strictly speaking, no. Is it welcome? Yeah. Yusuke saving Pooh, however, I always found to be one of those transcendent moments of the anime, in part because of the metaphorical role Pooh plays, and this being a representation of Yusuke. The ideal shonen protagonist, as I've mentioned before, is someone both entirely selfish and completely selfless. With no contradiction between such dynamics, these characters have enough greed and personal motivation to keep themselves going, while also understanding the higher nature of generosity and friendship. Yusuke's constant struggle for self-determination while also coming to terms with the fact that he isn't capable of becoming a heartless brute like Toguru, 
or alternatively a sadistic capitalist like Sakio, is the dynamic that exemplifies this sort of struggle between extremes. Pooh himself is unique because he can be seen both as Yusuke himself, but because he's an entity set apart from Yusuke, someone else. Either way you choose to look at it, it's a great moment for Yusuke to save Pooh in the cave, both as an act of selfless heroism and desire to improve himself. The music kicks all kind of ass too. In effect, that will do it for part 2. This is a more difficult section to create because barring Sakio's humanization, there was few and far between to really grab my attention on what needs to be deliberated over without getting into the content. However, I remain unsatisfied as a result. So there will be a bit of an extra video very soon on the undiscussed aspects of Kurama and Kuwabara. Also, if you ship Shizuru and Sakio, both ironically or unironically, dose yourself in holy water, you nasties.